Oh, well, I'm following you. Yeah, I'm following no, no, I'm, well, I want to go back to Gemini. Yeah, I wonder, did, I mean, did you have time to read or do something besides sing to each other? Well, we brought two books along. I think uh, uh, I had something like uh, Drums Along the Mohawk or something like that. I had Rough Hand. Yeah, you had Rough Hand. <laughs> we had, we, I started a, a diary. You know, we started, like all people start diaries, and then we just forgot it. We just kept looking out the window because actually, you know, we had uh, 45 uh, hours of uh, what it was, uh, daylight, and 45 at nighttime, and you know, so it was it was always exciting to look out the window. Yeah. So move forward, then let's let's go to Apollo. Then, uh, in fact, wait, let's go back to a, a Gemini 12. Uh, where, you know, Buzz went out and an EVA, but Gene Cernan's earlier uh, in Gemini, what, 9 or 10? Yeah, Gene uh, Cernan went out and, well, what we had to do was to figure out some way of working outside the spacecraft. Uh, and, uh, Ed White in Gemini 4 just went out and moved him around and it looked so easy. He brought came back in. So we had to figure out, well, if we stay outside the spacecraft, what can we do? So they, he was programmed to do it on Gemini 9, even with a backpack to go float around. Uh, but uh, Gene quickly found out that without the proper hand holes or foot holes, <laughs> that he was really fighting Newton's third law of motion, which means for every action there's an equal opposite reaction. And when he started to touch the spacecraft, it would react and then he was having a hard time just moving around. So he quickly got overheated. Uh, Heart rate went way up, so we stopped that. So we, on Gemini 10 and also Gemini 11, we tried to figure out how to do EVA. And at both those uh, times, it was also a failure. And so on Gemini 12, uh, we used uh, water immersion. I don't know who thought of it, it was a great idea. <clears throat> and used a boys' uh, swimming pool to go underwater and practice with a mock up on the spacecraft. Uh, and we put Buzz Aldrin in a space suit. The space suit can work just as well underwater as it can in space. We put flotation devices around him so he wouldn't float. So uh, it's uh, neutral and buoyant. Yeah. yeah, neutral. And then, uh, then he uh, started to work out how, how best to work uh, behind the, uh, behind the, uh, the spacecraft. And that worked out so that on 12, uh, we managed to have three space walks in a total of five and a half hours, I believe. It finally solved the EVA problem, and now, of course, today, both the United States and uh, Russia have huge swimming pools where before any of the work is done on the International Space Station uh, or in the past on the shuttles, uh, they would uh, go down there and practice to do that before they would go up. So uh, head to uh, Apollo 1, and uh, before it, it was supposed to fly, they had a tragic accident uh, on the launch pad. Three astronauts died that day. And of course, the program was shut down for what, 21, 22 months? I think. And, yeah. and how, how challenging was that uh, redesign and preparation to try to fly? Well, that, that showed your NASA at its best because uh, they immediately set to work to try to figure out how to fix it. And they, you know, finally, in the, in the real analysis, just like in, in everyday life, it gets down to the individuals. And the individual that I claim was the most responsible for the Apollo subsequent success was George Lowe, who was the Apollo program manager, and also Chris Kraft, who managed the flight track. And those two people carried the burden. Now, there are a lot of other people that helped them, but those two people and their groups really uh, oriented this towards success. So Apollo 7 was the first to send three guys up, and how successful was that? Well, I think it was very successful. Very successful. <clears throat> After the limit, all day flight around the Earth, and, and that was basically to check the <laughs> command module out to see if it worked perfectly, because things changed, as uh, Frank could probably tell us, uh, from uh, Earth Orbital, which we were going to do, uh, uh, nine was the heat, I guess, we were here. Yeah. and uh, he was called back in to uh, change the whole flight. 
Yeah, if Apollo 7, everybody talks about how critical this flight was or that one. They were all critical. If Apollo 7 had been nearly perfect, we'd have never gone up to the moon. That's right. And if Apollo 8 had been perfect, they'd have never gone up to yet. So it was a very well conceived, ambitious, and risk taking schedule, but it was, uh, it was not a random selection. So Apollo 8, we're together uh, with Bill Anders and Apollo 8. But your mission was changed. Why? What happened? Lovell and I and Anders were out in Downey, California, working on the, we were Apollo 9. We were working on the command launch, and I got a call from Slate, Pete Slate, our boss. He said, come back to the I want to talk to you. And uh, I didn't understand why, because I was on the phone with him. But uh, I got in the airplane, went back that same day, saw him in his office, and he said, uh, We've got word that the Russians are going to try to launch a vehicle around the moon before Christmas. We're going to take uh, Apollo 9, make it Apollo 8. What month was this? This was in August. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to make it Apollo 8, take the command module and service module along the moon. Do you, do you want to do it? <laughs> and I said, yes, we want to do it. And uh, went back and told Jim and Bill, and they agreed it was a Great idea. There was a second reason too. Grumman could not get the lunar module ready for a, a flight in 1968, which originally we were going to go with the lunar module around the Earth and test it all out. And uh, so those two things, the knowledge that the, what the Russians were going to do and the fact that we weren't going to have a lunar module anyway, uh, that was really a, a, a really a, a bold decision by NASA management.